This is episode 106 of Stand Up. I'm Pete Dominic. Joining me today, the executive director of Tax March, writer and activist, Maura Quint. Also, comedian and friend Christian Finnegan joins me to have a man-to-man about life, wrap up the week and news, and talk about our drinking. It's time to stand up with me right now. Let's roll, Tim. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the episode. We've got, I've got Maura Quint, who is really funny, really smart, really thoughtful, joining me today. She is the executive director of Tax March, and we had a great conversation the other day. I'm really excited to share this one with you, as well as Christian Finnegan, Finnegan and I, who joins me almost every Friday now. Last week, his wife was with us. Everybody raved about Cambry Cruise. And Christian and I talked about, we got pretty deep today and and talked about our drinking and and anxiety and how we're dealing with it all and really fascinating discussion. I wanted to open the show by also saying thank you to everybody who joined me on the Zoom chat on Thursday of this week where I welcomed Professor Kenneth C. Davis, my favorite historian, and 50 of my favorite people, subscribers to this show, joining me. First time I did that, and I got to say, it was quite a success. Kenneth C. Davis joined us. I interviewed him, and then everybody asked questions, and then we hung out and chatted and drank, and it was a lot of fun. If you're not a paid subscriber to the show, then you should sign up now and be a part of those sessions. I'm going to be having more of my guests join me live like that. At least I'm going to try to do once a week. And I'd love to have you be in that room and be able to ask a question and participate and just feel the energy of all of us in there connecting and having these great, brilliant guests joining us. So thank you to Ken C. Davis. I'll bring you that conversation here on the podcast next week. But again, sign up for a paid subscription and be a part of the community, the Stand Up with Pete Dominic community. And now I want to read to you the Today in one sentence section from Matt Kaiser's WTF just happened today. It's day 1211 of the Trump presidency. Today in one sentence, he writes another 2.98 million people filed unemployment claims last week, bringing the two month total to 36.5 million. The White House threatened to veto a three trillion dollar pandemic relief bill. Trump criticized Dr. Anthony Fauci's warning about the risks of reopening schools and businesses too soon as not an acceptable answer. The Trump administration plans to extend the coronavirus border restrictions indefinitely, because why not? And Senator Richard Burr stepped down as chairman of the Intel Committee following an FBI investigation into whether he sold stocks after secret briefings on the threat of a coronavirus pandemic and a federal appeals court revived a lawsuit accusing Trump of illegally profiting from the presidency. That's today and one sentence from Thursday. That is uh, May 14th. Today I'm taping this. Uh, This is for the Friday, May 15th show. I should say generally tape the intro the night before, late the night before. And a couple shows ago I had been drinking. I was a little drunk. I wouldn't say drunk, but, you know, I was just messing up here at the top, which I always do. But I mentioned I've been drinking some some whiskey and Coke and Marilyn, who's a very thoughtful listener and subscriber, was worried about me and sent me an email saying that when you you know, it's it's a bad sign, Pete, when you start drinking in the morning and it just does make sense. I try to make it sound like I'm taping this the morning of and that it's all, you know, right there for you almost live. But that's it's all an illusion, you know. And I uh, am doing this the night before, Marilyn. I emailed her back, said, don't worry, I'm not drinking in the morning. I don't think I've ever had a drink in the morning. Seriously, I'm, I'm not. Alcohol is not a thing for me uh, yet. I enjoy it, but I'm not abusing it. I think that's fair to say. My wife would be the first wor- person to tell me if I was. So Marilyn and everybody else, don't worry about it. I'm not drinking in the morning. Okay, so great conversation coming up with Maura Quint. And just a little context here. Maura, I was going to air this one back to back with Dr. Jason Johnson. I decided to, to, to keep it for today. And Jason Johnson and I talked a lot about interracial relationships and we got really deep. And so I went from that into Maura and she opened our conversation by telling me that her first boyfriend was a young black man when she was a teenager in high school. And it, opens this conversation with a fascinating and heartbreaking story about her relationship with him and how that all went. And then we got into a whole bunch of other things. She is awesome on Twitter. She's the executive director of a really, her Twitter handle is at behind your back. 
She's the executive director of a very important nonprofit called Tax March, which I hope you will support. Here's my conversation with Maura Quint right now. All right, so now I have Maura Quint, and I was just telling Maura about the conversation I had with Jason. So I guess I'll play that one first. And we were talking about inter- we're talking about dating and interracial dating and all of that that you just heard. And I'm telling Maura about that, and then you start telling me a story yeah, I- from your high school, your first like crush love boyfriend was, love. Boyfriend? this was like the first person i ever said i love you too and and uh said i he loved me back and all that but i mean we're in central pennsylvania which is very white very christian um and so like i was the one lone jew I was still white but you know different i suppose by being jewish and, uh, he was the one black person basically uh in our like whole uh, high school so we dated for like years And I have very strong memories of like, we were, you know, doing what kids do. We were making out uh, in a parked car on like a suburban street. And I mean, high school making out, this wasn't like X-rated or anything. We were just like, you know, kissing and uh, cops pulled up and like banged on the window with the stick and the whole deal. And I mean, he screamed and was terrified, but they only then addressed me. And it was just like, are you all right, miss? Like, is like I was being attacked when obviously we were just like happy high schoolers making out. And it was like, that was very, um, localizing to me who had come from this like line of privilege, you know, my whole life, I was just a white person living in a world with mostly white people. I had didn't have any personal experience to that. So it was very much like a, holy shit, (laughs) I have a ton of privilege here. And this is something really, really jarring and significant. And what was, was a the, very upsetting experience. Do, do you recall, uh, I'm asking you to recall a conversation from years ago, but like, what was the conversation, if, if, if you remember, with your boyfriend after, after that? And did anything change in terms of the way you behaved in public, if public is your own car making out? No, it didn't. And we were, you know, we were kids. Like, I was probably 16. He was 18. Uh, I don't think either of us necessarily had the emotional maturity to have like a real important conversation about what had happened at that time. Uh, we got around the conversations, you know, a decade later after we were just friends and, and past that point. But like, I think at the time we were just kind of shaken, like just kids would be any kid, like having a cop come up and, and yell at you in some way. And it didn't really change things for us as a couple. I think it changed us individually. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and what about the fact that you were dating one of the only black kids in the community? How did your family feel? How did his family feel? If anything, everybody cool. My family was, you know, very, at least, you know, they acted very cool. They never said anything. I had extended family that made a comment once, uh, and then I never spoke to them again. His family, <laughs> uh, did not, it was not quite the same. His family had a problem with it. What was the it's comment? Mom. What was the comment? You don't want to tell me what the comment, me. the comment, your family member. No, I don't know. They made some jungle fevery kind of comment or whatever. Ugh. I don't know. I never like, it was so gross. And then I never, I just never spoke to those and his, ever his, again. So his family had an issue. Yeah. His mom hated me. She did not like that. He was, I mean, yeah, they, they, but they didn't really, they wouldn't really talk to me about it. Um, his sisters were really nice and like, I loved them and got along with them and I really wanted to get along with his mom and tried, but maybe that was part of the problem. <laughs> this like white girl, like, try, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure I, I was terrible in, in ways that I can only imagine. And I never want to roll tape on that part of my life again. But, uh, but no, she was not, she was not on board with him being with someone who was uh, white at all. That's interesting. Well, I appreciate you letting me roll tape on you reminiscing about that. <laughs> and, uh, I'm glad we stepped on that because uh, it, th- these stories are, are fascinating. Obviously, I would I want to think that things have changed a lot with interracial dating, but maybe not as much in certain parts of the country. And maybe it's maybe it's gotten worse in some some parts of the country or, or communities. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you well, measure like everything when you're talking about race in this country, like to say that it's gotten better would be really reductive and ridiculous because obviously like we see that it hasn't. And so while a couple of individual attitudes may have gotten better systemically, it's not better. We have a lot to do. We do have a lot to do. Let's talk about what we have to do in terms of, um, racial injustice and fighting that economic justice. I mean, it's all certainly tied in and, and you're somebody who knows a lot about these issues. 
Uh, you are the executive director of Tax March. What have you, what has this your organization been doing during the pandemic? How have you adjusted and adapted to both the pandemic in terms of what your strategy might be, the government um, bailouts for small businesses and individuals, and obviously, you know, a presidential election? How have you what, what major changes or strategies or campaigns have you started? Uh, well, you know, mostly what has changed is our strategies, because, of course, we love doing like big in-person things, but um, that's really not a great idea right now, especially because we're not carrying guns or like, you know, yelling uh, MAGA slogans. So like, it's not great for us to be all gathered together. Fair enough. Um, yeah. So <laughs> we've, we've gone digital like everybody else and, uh, you know, are doing lots of uh, online actions. And I mean, the one thing that is maybe... I. I don't want to call it a plus side, but like the one thing that um, for activists and organizers who were like struggling to be able to reach people, uh, a lot more people are spending a lot more time online now. So there's like this audience that's a little bit captive in a way. That's and great. Looking so, for something. Yeah. So so your your message you think is resonating more now because people are just more in front of their screens. I think we have the opportunity to definitely reach people. Uh, more and certainly we're trying to you know we've like shifted everything to to being online and being digital and uh we're doing the best we can with all of it but you know i mean like like always like every single day there's just a constant overload of information coming out and uh during this coronavirus it's like it's a struggle too because everything you're hearing is just like well the world is ending we're all gonna die it's all terrible you're never gonna be able to leave your house again you're never gonna see anyone you love and uh you're probably going to like wind up uh, alone, dying, unable to talk. Like, it's just such a constant, steady uh, beam of awfulness that, like, it, it's also a little bit hard sometimes to be like, hey, wait, here's one more shitty thing that we want to tell you about. Right. Yeah, but, I, under, I understand. And it's, that's hard to find a balance and, and communicate in a way that, that you feel like you're striking, I suppose, the right tone and the and prioritizing things. But nonetheless, I mean, what we have seen, the government's reaction to uh, this this situation. Um, and, I, you know, I obviously want to get your take on it. I read today. I, I think I retweeted it. This is horrible. But it was something like 40 percent of families. I think it's 40 percent of families who make under forty thousand dollars have lost their jobs, meaning the vast majority of people who make, you know, forty thousand dollars under or rather just under half of them have lost their jobs. The people that can't afford to lose their jobs and and probably I'm making an assumption have the less uh, savings are the ones that are in in the worst situation and the rest of America not so much and when I read that stat it was just like devastation catastrophic yeah we were already on the brink of the Great Depression before any of this hit we already had these like ridiculously widening wealth uh, gaps and that certainly the the racial wealth gap is is the worst. Uh, that it's been. And now we have something just like absolutely lighting a match to this, setting it on fire and completely exploding it to a, a really, really terrible point. It's uh, it's terrifying. And I, I read somewhere now too, like we now have four different classes. Like you're either a billionaire, a Zoom user, an essential worker, or unemployed. Like that's it. You follow <laughs> one of those four things. So we've really like narrowed it into these tiny little uh, subsects, which is awful. And it's going to have some tremendously dire consequences across the board. It's already wreaking havoc uh, on many people's lives. Yeah. And, and, and the people who are most vulnerable financially are also having to put themselves in harm's way. And you see the president um, and other, I think, you know, governors, forcing those people to go to work in places like meat packing plants. And then if they do get sick, they also don't have any, any legal recourse because the government is giving those uh, those companies immunity from. That's from, what they're fighting for. Yeah. Do, That's what, you, what they're trying to do. It's infuriating. I mean, like when you look at just sort of the building blocks of how we can have any sort of accountability across um, any of our industries, what they're trying to do is basically say like, hey, whatever corporation you are, you can do whatever the hell you want to whomever you want all the time. 
and no one can fucking say shit to you. And that's it. Like, that's what McConnell is putting down is this red line. Like, that's the most important thing. That's the most important thing. People are dying. They can't get food. They have nowhere to live. But that's the most important thing. We got to make sure that a corporation doesn't get sued for literally throwing people into the slaughter. What do you make of that uh, that policy to force? <laughs> no, the policy to force. <laughs> what do you mean? Are you pro or con that? No, what <laughs> the policy to force pe- yeah. people to have to work in meat plants like is um, I forget who wrote it. Jonathan Safran for a, 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 an op ed about meat is not essential. Meatpacking, you know, employees are not essential workers. I mean, it is food, but is is there a better alternative than than forcing people to work? shoulder to shoulder and, and, uh, you know, meat packing plants. Yeah. I mean, there are definitely ways that you can open industries if that's what is deemed best. I'm certainly not going to like wade into a conversation about whether everyone should be vegan or not. Um, but beyond that, like you can enforce standards. You can make sure that there are, uh, that they're keeping employees safe. Like these industries have the abilities to do that. They're just choosing not to. And I mean, that's, always been the way right like we have we're we're just hurtling towards like triangle shirtwaist fires all over again all the time like but rather than just the one that sparked something we're gonna we're gonna have them across the country across industries in this sort of constant motion and i think the idea is to just to like wear us down where we're just like yeah no that's another triangle shirtwaist fire yeah well that sucks but oh there's one over there too what i what i don't you know what i'm trying to (laughs) figure out. And what I'm hoping to see is, is, is kind of a new labor movement. I had a a guest on not too long ago named Steve Levine, who talked about that we're about to see, you know, a labor movement, a very empowered labor movement for the 21st century. And I feel like maybe it's because I'm not paying attention and I'm not an organizer, but I I haven't really uh, feel like I've seen that they have these, these people who we generally uh, ignore and, uh, you know, they don't have a voice. They don't have any influence. They have very little uh, bargaining power uh, because, you know, organized labor has been so beaten down and unions so long. Now, you know, these are delivery people. These are healthcare workers. These are migrant farmers. If they organize right now and say, we're not going to go pick food. We're not going to go and take care of your grandmother at the nursing home. We're not going to deliver your stuff. Um, we're all the rest of us are going to be forced to pay attention and to pay them a living wage and give them the protective gear that they need. I, I, I Have you seen any of that movement? Do you think they have the leverage? Do you think that'll happen? Well, I mean, organizing is really complicated and certainly labor organizing is very, very complex. And it is it varies greatly industry to industry. And there are a lot of fantastic um, organizations that are specialized and that are working on getting particular industries together. But um, a lot of it is building those relationships and it happens in ways I think that we don't necessarily see, which isn't me saying like, don't worry, the the magic labor fairies will come at night and they'll like, oh, they'll sprinkle like protest and revolt across the nation. Like, that's not what <laughs> oh, I, mean I want to believe in the magical <laughs> know, labor fairies. I know I do too. But, you know, it does mean that there are things happening that we don't necessarily see. Um, and I think that when these um, protests do crop up, I think there will be some. Um, they will probably surprise us a little bit. I don't think we're going to like have heard, have heard about them for a, a while. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should just assume that's going to happen. You know, organizing is a communal thing. We should all necessarily be part of it. We should be talking to people about it. We should be finding out, uh, you know, is there organizing happening in the industry that we're in, in the industry that our parents are in or, or whomever else. It's something that we should all be kind of trying to take a little bit of a hand in, but I think it can happen. I actually, um, what I've been doing is like hosting all of these trivia nights just for fun. Cause I love it. So I've just been like looking up trivia nonstop. And, uh, last night I found out that the first on the record organized strike was, I think I want to say 1150 BC in Egypt. Uh, some <laughs> bunch really? of, yeah, they, they weren't getting paid. They walked off the job and the outcome was that they got higher wages. Like, 1150 BC, we're talking about organized labor strikes and they were effective. So I feel like, you know, we haven't, we haven't grown that much. We can still do this. Wow. That's a really, really, I would, now I want to be invited to a trivia night, by the way, who's, who gets, I'm pretty good at trivia. I'm not good at almost any kind of game, um, but I've always been good at trivia. 
So the, my trivia nights, actually, we started via tax march. Um, we started doing a Tuesday night tax march trivia for like our organizers and activists. Just cool. to, yeah, know, just to keep connected. Like yeah, social, yeah. Yeah, like thing. And then they were so much fun that I was like, well, I want to do this across the board. So then I just like started gathering, uh, you know, people and, and friends. So you'll be on the next email. Can you you'll think of definitely. one question off the top of your head and I can and I can fail publicly? Uh, one trivia question. I can yeah. pull up a bunch of them. Can you pull um, yeah, or, or, or either take your time, pull one up or ask me like, <laughs> um, I always like, I think of trivia, I think of trivial pursuit and I think of the categories that I'm better in and the, the ones that I want to avoid. I'm no good at music. That's the one I hate, but I have a music round every, every single night. So mm -hmm. my trivia rounds are five different rounds mm -hmm. and they vary week to week. And I usually like choose a topic. So yesterday the whole thing was May themed, which is why I went into labor okay. because I had like one whole round was about May day. So it was about, you said, I, you said the phrase, I went into labor and it confused me. I was like, what the, <laughs> you went into Sorry. labor yesterday? It was a know. really busy day. Okay. It was very stressful. I thought you would have led with that. How are you even available? You just got to, you know, you roll with it. You, you, you do look with what great. you got on hand. I mean, you know, I nod the cord and all of that. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's not a big deal. Once you've had one, it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Right. Matter. <laughs> wow. You bounced back. Okay. <laughs> all right. May themed. I wonder what that even How means. About, uh, I know. Well, because there, there was a lot of, all right. How are you on Star Wars? I had a whole okay. Star Wars category. I mean, I'm not great, but okay. All right. I'll give you my most fun one. It's okay. not, it's not too difficult. Yeah, give me some fun. Cause I'm about to ask you another um, depressing thing. So go ahead. Sure. You know, like, uh, have, do you know before and after categories where like it merges together, you need like two or three names and then you put them all together as one name. Oh, that sounds intimidating, but okay. All right. So this, the clue for this one, this is, Everything includes a Star Wars category, but it would be the former Soviet Union's droid is as nasty as they want to be. So there are three sections there. Uh, was, I, I'm out. I'm out. I just got <laughs> so much fucking anxiety. I don't even want to. You know what? And I also don't want to. I don't want to come to your trivia night. I just want you to ask me a question and I want to answer it. The idea that I had to think about all those categories just gave me a massive panic attack. And I'm so embarrassed oh my now, too. Oh, my gosh. Not a massive oh. panic attack. It just made me want to punch. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Red uh, 2D2. I don't know. Leave me alone. Why did I ask? You're, you're in the right. You're totally in the right world. Red 3PO. No, okay, wait, wait. The former Soviet Union. Start there. What's the word for the, what do we call the former the Soviet USSR. Union? The USSR. And then you had USSR 2D2. You're already, you're two thirds there. And then as nasty as they want to be, it's going to start with two. USS R2-D2 live crew is the... Oh, okay. All right. Well, see, you I didn't know it. the format, but it's still... That's right. and I, I, don't... I threw you with a weird format. No, you didn't. I'm just <laughs> dumb at that stuff. And my kids do that stuff. I was at a thing where we just had another family over and they were doing something like this where, you know, there's an alphabet and you have to start the next word. And, and oh. I, and it was, they had little kids my daughters were there at my wife. Everybody was in on it. And I shake when it got to me. I was like, ha ah, ha ha. I don't know. And I left. Should I invite your kids? To yes, sure. Time? They'd be, they'd love it. My wife they would love go. it. Everybody else. But that's uh, good. You can stand there and just, you know, panic. Um, okay. So that's, I'm not nearly good enough to play in that trivia uh, game. And I would be embarrassed <laughs> and you would be like, oh, I'm sorry. My dumb friend, Pete, I invited him. He's not good. It's okay. All my friends are dumb. You'd fit right in. I doubt that. Okay. So, I do want to ask you if you paid attention at all to yesterday's Supreme Court argument, because it was, you know, kind of in your world right. in terms of taxes. You know, the idea that the president of the United States, any president of the United States, any mayor, any governor, anybody running for public office wouldn't be transparent about where their money was, where they were divested, um, uh, you know, where they benefited is bizarre. But this president, you know, even though every other president has shown their taxes, everybody knows the story. Yesterday's Supreme Court heard arguments about uh, the president's financial documents being disclosed, two different lawsuits, one House Democrats and the other, I think, the Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance, both wanting those financial records for really important reasons. Uh, I don't know if you paid any attention to the arguments yesterday, Maura, but what do you think about that dilemma, about that case, about the fact that this president has still not released his taxes and financial records? I did listen to uh, quite a bit of it yesterday. Unfortunately, there were no toilet flushes. So really what we uh, yeah, were that listening was for. That's, last that's, week. Did we ever find out who's yeah. who flushed their toilet? You know, I think Ashley Feinberg is a journalist who put in a tremendous amount of work to actually uncover it. And yeah. she had a whole theory. I did not yet read her article. So I, I no spoilers here. But OK, 
I think it might have been. The investigative journalism has been done on that. Um, Okay. That's (laughs) interesting. It is a ridiculous thing, the tax returns issue. I mean, it's what Tax March was founded on, um, and it was a bipartisan effort when Tax March was founded because it was an oversight issue. It wasn't like a Dems are bad or Republicans are bad. It was just a the president is accountable to the people. Pretty straightforward. Not liberal, not conservative. It wasn't. It really wasn't. Yeah. Um, and now, uh, you know, obviously, uh, Trump is hiding probably many things. Like, let's not say just one thing. He's, I'm sure he's hiding many, many things at this point. Many um, things, to... many, many things. Could be a lot of <laughs> things, could be a few things, many things. Oh, God. The cadence of that, like 20 years from now, someone's going to use a Trumpian cadence and I'm, I'm going to start have, having panic attacks. Still going to have an like, issue with it. Yeah, yeah. It's going to start like PTSD. popping pills and not even know why. Yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> you won't be alone. <laughs> Probably not. The pill popping industry will do very well. Um, so... Yeah, uh, we just had these uh, coronavirus relief bills. And in the bills, there were massive giveaways to corporations, um, as well as tax cuts for rich people in a coronavirus relief bill that needed to help people who were actually suffering. Uh, And one of the things that was in the last CARES Act for a moment before Trump said, no, that's, we're not going to uh, hold to that. But there was a line in there originally that said uh, Trump could not profit from this relief bill. Problem is, we would have no way of knowing. There's no right. way of following up on that. Like, he, we don't know because we haven't seen his goddamn fucking tax return. And it would, it, would, it would solve so many problems, including, like, the idea that he's pushing people to take a certain drug and you're saying why is he pushing americans to take an unproven drug maybe maybe he and that's and his scumbag son-in-law are have something to gain from from this it's not it's crazy but it's not a an obtuse idea to think that he would do that of course he would do that he'd been doing that his entire life and it's and he's been doing it his entire presidency as well i right. mean he the amount that he has made off of his hotels and enforcing uh people to stay there whether they're coming to visit whether it's administration whatever and then jacking up the prices of those rooms and making exorbitant profits like he has absolutely been profiting off of the presidency the entire time poor jimmy carter and his blind trust peanut farm yeah 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 <laughs> so it's... naive so sweet. although do you i mean i do i am open to the argument that he probably he might have lost more money than he's made because his brand is so gross and evil that a lot of people wouldn't want to stay at the hotel or you know in new york they took his name off the buildings uh because new yorkers hate him so much i do wonder if he actually has lost more money than he has gained. He, clearly, he's trying to profit off the presidency, but his brand is pretty soiled around the world now. I don't think so. I mean, when we look at like the laws that he has passed that made him a ton of money anyway, I mean, maybe he he's lost some in like some product areas, but he's made it all back and giving himself giant tax cuts at every turn and, uh, you know, and finding ways to like get around... <laughs> ever having any sort of obligation to anything. So, I mean, like I, I would be very surprised if he, um, if he ultimately lost money. Well, you could, uh, you could probably make the argument. I, I wonder if you'd agree with this, that had he shown a- a- any kind of, he didn't have the ability, let's be clear, but any kind of leadership through this uh, pandemic, there might've been a lot less loss of life and we might've been able to get it under control sooner, meaning all of his uh, buildings and hotels and golf courses would have, you know, cause everybody's losing money. And I'm sure including his businesses as a result of this, if he had been a better president, maybe, you know, people would have been golfing and maybe spending money at his hotels. But, you know, it's almost it's 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 easy to say that a lot of this is his fault and the economy is his fault and he hurts because of it. Yeah, uh, that's that's certainly true. Um, and at the same time, I don't think he's losing a lot of his customer base. And I think that he is um going to find plenty of ways to jack up all the sort of prices uh, for anyone who's he I, I have no doubt that he's going to maneuver this into just having additional money. Did like, the administration oh. request that that part get taken out of the CARES Act that he could not profit from it? Did they did they overtly say, no, we won't support that. He has to be able to profit from it. So after he, they didn't they passed it with that in it. But yeah. then after it passed, he like explicitly. Uh, took out some portions of it and said uh, executive order 
these don't matter. <laughs> um, and the oh. oversight portions, and I'm not even sure if that necessarily that line was one of them because they were definitely ones that had to do with whether Steve Mnuchin had to have any sort of like, uh, had to report out anything uh, that he was doing and giving the money away that he got rid of that. I'm assuming he got rid of the line saying he couldn't profit as well. At the same time, again, it doesn't matter if we can't see his tax returns because who can fucking uh, hold him to right, that? Right, right. Um, And then the other issue that I thought was outrageous, um, really outrageous, was that these checks that a lot of people were waiting on didn't go out until his name was put on them. And it it meant a few more days. I mean, and and, and it's just, you know, the White House is trying to act like they had nothing to do with that. And, and, you know, maybe they didn't. Maybe Treasury just was kissing his ass because all these people are just trying to kiss his ass to ingratiate themselves with them. But either way, the idea that that any president would care about that in this situation, I understand why you want your name on a bill that you're proud of or something like that. But in a in an emergency where people need the money right now, they had to wait because his name wasn't on it. And lots of people still haven't gotten the money. I mean, plenty of people who need it very desperately still haven't. And lots of people won't because of the way that it was structured and the way that uh, it required um, bank accounts, for instance, in order to get money. A lot of people don't have the account they need to get that wired indirectly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And plenty more people. I mean, if if you didn't um, like have a uh, social security number, like if, if you were in various other legal status areas, you're not necessarily getting any money. And, and that's, those are people who pay taxes and need money as well and are, are pretty desperate. What else do you think this lays bare, um, this, this pandemic in terms of, as you mentioned, those people that were already living on the edge, were already oh. so vulnerable uh, from, you know, on, on issues like healthcare and issues like immigration um, and, and other job opportunities. I mean, what else do you think that this pandemic and the the either reaction to it or lack of reaction to it by the federal government, especially much less local and state governments, lays bare that we have a real problem in America and now we see it more than ever? I think, you know, what has been incredibly frustrating to me is when we see how much um, our country is divided. And I don't mean that we are inherently divided. I mean, we are being divided. I mean, hmm. We have these different um, people are very angry and they're terrified and that's fair. Yep. Everyone has every right to be angry and terrified. People don't know how they're going to be able to live in their wherever they live. If they can pay for that, they don't know how they're going to be able to feed their kids. They don't know how they're going to be able to get any help if they do get sick. Uh, and even if, if they, and even if they do have a lot of resources, even if they're wealthy, they're the scared part that you mentioned because they're scared of getting sick or their loved ones getting sick. So, yeah, everybody's scared, even those who have resources. Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, that's exactly right. It, we are very, very uh, fearful right now, and we have different sort of groups preying upon that fear. And it's very, very strong. And when you look to these, like the protests, the reopen protests, um, they're not necessarily even that big, the protests themselves. Right, right. They get a lot of play, but yeah. They get a ton of play. They get really exaggerated in terms of their numbers. But also those are people who, for the, I mean, look, they're terrible pieces of shit in there. Don't get me wrong. They're just, you know, racist motherfucking, like there's the worst people in those groups, but there are plenty of people as well who are scared and desperate and see the only way that they could ever have any help is if they just can open their business or they can get back to work and get a paycheck and they don't know what else to do. And they don't know what else to do because they're being told that's the only option. Like right. that's it. And it's not, not it's a false to- choice. It's a completely false choice. And that's what's incredibly frustrating because, you know, we need to be able to reach everyone and sort of and get out the message that, you know, you could be helped. This isn't this is not the choice that you have to be taking. You don't have to either go uh, have a job where you could kill someone or die or else be, you know, suffering and possibly die. Like you actually, regardless of whether you I don't care if you're a libertarian who believes that no one should fucking ever pay taxes. And we just like the government is oppression. And like, even if that's who you are, you've already paid those taxes. Like you, you did, the money is already there. So I don't really care what you think about what should happen. That money has already been collected. It's all of our money. It could be going to help us all stay home and stay safe and stay secure. Like that could be happening and it's not. And it's frustrating um, when you see people who, they're like that part has even been shut out. The, that message just has not gotten in because it was filled so fully with like 
no, <laughs> that well, doesn't exist. That's just, you know, socialism. You mentioned, yeah, you mentioned the divide too. And it, it's just so fascinated. And I, this is the one thing I've been probably most obsessed with in my career in media is, is science denial and the conspiracy theories really interested in, in all of that. Um, the psychology behind it, why people make the choices they make, follow the paths that they follow. And yesterday during that Senate hearing of the experts, Dr. Fauci and others, I think, right, um, mm -hmm. there were there was a partisan divide over the senators wearing masks. Yeah. The, the Republicans were not wearing masks and dumb Rand Paul was not trusting science and the and the Democrats were wearing masks and were trusting the science. And I think that one of the most fascinating, you know, we have this this uh, scientific consensus about something about climate change which is hard to understand climate science, but epidemiology is also a little difficult to understand, but there's also a consensus there as to how viral pandemics break out. There's no divide amongst actual epidemiologists yet. Why is there a divide amongst Republicans or conservatives versus Democrats and liberals? How is this a thing? How the virus does not discriminate on any grounds at all. I mean, partially it's because of what a mask does, right? Like the mask is less for your protection than it is to protect others from you. And so you have to have some sense of communal responsibility to want to wear a mask in the first place because you're really thinking about other people and where your spit is going. You're not really thinking about what's coming back at you. So, I mean... <laughs> You know, <laughs> I hate to be so uh, so completely bipartisan, but like that's what I'm seeing from Republican leadership. You're saying it's about it's about it's about the type of people that just don't care about other people, yeah. which you see that thread. At least a lot of us do uh, progressives um, on the right that they 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 only care about themselves and they don't want to participate in any kind of public uh, a program or a government. That's what I see from leadership. I want to be clear because as much as I and media, and right wing media, definitely I consider that leadership. Frankly, that yeah. you're actually right. Yeah, they're leading the conversation. Like yeah, that's you are. the same basic thing to me because they're all. I mean, it's it's just a constant hypocrisy, right? Like they're all still. Fox News is still airing from their own homes while telling everybody they should all be like storming down the the. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Glenn Steel Beck and, and back yeah. to work. like it, it's ridiculous. And I, I think that a lot of people are being fed these messages um, and it's coming from terrible places. Um, uh, one more thing I definitely want to talk to you about is the election. Um, and, you know, I saw this uh, tweet. I don't know who this person is, but I screen grabbed it. Jody Jacobson um, huh? tweeted. Here is the GOP plan about the election. Mark my words. Obstruct vote by mail at every turn by every means. Destroy the post office so that those who can get ballots can't get them in on time. Let the pandemic explode in the fall, thereby scaring people away from the polls. Our democracy dies. I am sad to say that I see that as uh, the strategy. And and all they have to do, by the way, to employ that strategy is nothing. They just right. it'll it'll happen. The, the post office runs out of money. Nobody gets their ballots. Uh, people get sicker because the you know they're they're not doing anything, and it makes it harder for people to show up in November, if at all. Yeah, no, I mean, like you know, obviously we know that we can't really trust anybody to protect the democratic institutions at this point, um, which is incredibly frustrating. And you know, it's it's tricky because uh, I'm always wary of like ascribing too much thought into these things. Like I, I don't agree. know that anyone's sitting strategy, down and actually yeah. having that sort of strategy. Right. But the fact that that's what happens when you do nothing. Yeah. That could very well happen because sure. They, why would they do something like what's they, that would be crazy to begin with. So the fact that that could play out that way. Yeah. I can see that playing out. Um, what do you think of, uh, you know, Joe Biden, I haven't talked to you in a while, you know, getting the <laughs> nomination and, and, and what it what it means, the allegations against Joe Biden. Thoughts on that by uh, Tara Reid? Yeah, uh, I believe the allegations. I have no reason not to at this point in time. Uh, I find it incredibly frustrating personally that uh, Joe Biden is the nominee. Yeah. Um, and my way of dealing with that personally is to shift all of my attention to local races um, because 
ultimately, I don't feel as though my voice is going to change the Democratic nominee. I don't feel as though I have that sort of influence or say. So I can beat my head against a wall. Um, or I can take that energy and put it into thing, places where I feel like I can actually be pretty useful. So um, I'm trying very hard to like look at, for instance, I'm in Pennsylvania, um, look at our state summit. You know, Pennsylvania State Senate could be blue, but, you know, we're going to have to flip some local state Senate uh, races. So that's the sort of thing that I'm pouring all of my attention into as I try. Well, to- that's a great uh, that's a great idea for anybody else who feels you know similar to you that it's like, I can't I can't put my emotion and energy into into, you know, getting this guy elected because of how I feel about this. I'm focused on local elections. That being said, we still have to vote for Joe Biden. That's what's rough. Yeah, no, I mean, it, I. I'm also in a place where I don't feel like I can tell anyone, um, especially, you know, given the Tara Reid situation, I don't mm. think I can tell a survivor of sexual assault what they have to do uh, when they're faced with this situation. I thought I, th- I was thinking about this kind of thought experiment and it's like, it's like, okay, um, both, let's say both of these men are terrible. Um, but, but one of them is going to push and always, you know, and has for a long time for policies that protect women, violence against women and so on. And one of them is not. So, yes, you may have been a victim or a survivor. And yes, it is horrible to have to believe that that these both these nominees have been accused of these things and, you know, that they that you believe that they happen. But if you want to do less harm than you know, have less women or people be victims, then then one guy is right on the policy. What do you think of that thought experiment? Um, so I think that that's a totally uh, reasonable thought experiment and certainly one that I understand. And I understand why people uh, take it. And I understand people who say that's why uh, they're going to ju- vote one way or another. I fully get that. And I, I support it. You know, I mean, fundamentally, voting is a very personal thing. Um, and so well, it used to be. <laughs> it, it should be. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, it is and it's not. Uh, you're right. But um, but I don't think that I can necessarily like. I don't feel that I can necessarily tell anyone how to vote. I also don't think that anyone is necessarily, uh, I don't think I'm in a place where anyone would listen to me. I don't think that I'm in a place where I'm going to change anyone's mind one way or another. And I also um, have heard plenty. I've heard that thought experiment. Mm -hmm. I've heard the thought experiment of, uh uh-huh. We have to address the reasons that we ended up with Trump in the first place. And if we are going to, put in sort of this moderating, get us back to normal force, what we're going to end up with is double Trump next time. And so there's like, there's, there's that thought experiment that I've heard as well. And I'm not uh, endorsing any thought experiment. Uh, Double Trump is a terrifying idea. I I think that's Don Jr. Isn't it? Oh God. I think it's worse than him, but I mean, I don't know. What's worse than Don Eric. I mean, those guys are like, they're terrible, but they're terrible. in like, the worst date of your life kind of way. I feel like they're not quite to like genocidal, homicidal. Uh, like. Yeah, no, someone that's worse than Trump would be someone that is, uh, has his lack of any morality at all, but is a lot smarter in employing the strategy of Mussolini. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, even, we have now, like Trump has done a really good job of showing us how few protections we have in place against yeah. true evil. Um, and so he's really kind of like opened the doors up for anyone who wants to be truly, uh, to, to not just be, as evil as narcissistic as he is, but evil with a plan, like strategically evil, which, um, you know, I don't know that I would argue he's not quite to the extent that a person could be. He's not quite Hitler yet. Uh, not, not yet, but he's got a lot of blood in his hands. A lot of people are uh, yes, just outwardly saying now, yeah, someone who is it, uh, my friend Michael Cohen at the Boston Globe just wrote, he surpassed Bush now as worst president, because up until the pandemic, he wasn't responsible for a tremendous amount of death, Trump. But now he is, you know, that's like the the which terrible fucking leader is worse game is one of those like there. I I never want to play because I don't I all I can do is be wrong because all you can do is tell me one more shitty, horrible, yeah. like, evil thing that the other person did that I forgot about or didn't know about. Like, yeah, they're all they're all fucking awful. And we I hear you, but I think that anymore. I hear you. But I think history matters. And you, we do need to I do we, do, we need matters. to rank like the president. I wasn't saying you didn't think history mattered. That, that was very <laughs> condescending. Well, I think history matters more. <laughs> Fuck history. I decided <laughs> I'm never going to learn anything about it. What harm could that ever come? That was so condescending. Well, I think history matters. So, um, no, I mean, I like in terms of like your history books. Yeah. Well, in terms of like who is the worst president, 
you, you, you do go to like most death and then you go to economics and corruption and other horrible things, racism and sexism. And stuff. But like you start with who is responsible for more in this case, American death. I mean, they should always argue foreign deaths, of course, Cambodians and Iraqis and Afghans and so on. But uh, but, you know, Trump now, you know, in our lifetime, we thought Bush was horrible because especially the Iraq war, Hurricane Katrina, the economy. And now Trump is way worse. I totally agree that, you, you know, you don't care about this argument deaths is like a totally reasonable. If you're going to choose one factor, that's a great one to go. But now are you when you say like, OK, well, then we get to the economy. But are you talking about the people who died from starvation and homelessness and and, uh, right, right, you know, right. and, and suicide and, and like, mm. like there's so many contributing factors to death. And I'm not looking at like all of this. I mean, you. I have no problem believing that in terms of we're just adding up like the morbid count. You're probably right. But I, I don't know. No, that's a good point. It's a good to think of it more, uh, you know, I'm not going to say holistically, um, eh, but that's uh, the only word I thought of too. <laughs> in, a, in a broader, in a broader way about what results in, 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 in actual death. And we can talk about healthcare and yeah, food insecurity. All right. Speaking of food insecurity, let's end on a fun note. You like to cook, I think. Um, I do. Uh, what is the, uh, Either the best thing you've made that's new or the thing that you have enjoyed making a lot often. And I got to say, I'm not I'll, I'll give you another second to, to think about it while I answer. I'm not an originally original thinking person. I'm not much for cooking. I do like good food. My wife is great, but uh, I was actually influenced and, and inspired by those stupid videos with uh, Senator Mark Warner and Senator Kamala Harris. I made a tuna melt for the first time. <laughs> and I nailed it. It was really good. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. You're up. Uh, well, I have been doing a lot of cooking. I've been doing a lot of baking uh, just for the fun of it. But actually, yeah. what I like doing the most that I've because like, you know, I used to just go to the grocery store and pop off and like, <clears throat> sorry, buy something that I, you know, an ingredient I needed and mm -hmm. stuff. And now it's like, all right, I'm getting groceries once every two Gotta weeks. Be more organized. Well, I also am just like, I'm going to use everything up like very like. Right. Yeah. Which yep. I love. So then like I love at the end of those two weeks being like, all right, I'm going to MacGyver this. Like I have half of a zucchini and like yeah, that's <laughs> like a little bit of couscous and like uh, there's like one sprig left of rosemary. And we're like, that's the most fun to me now. It's just creating. Like, yeah, it's, it's actually like it's a serious exercise in sustainability. It's yeah. something that people living in poverty certainly deal with on a regular basis. And I think that's why my wife is like kind of always done that. I'm like what's for dinner tonight? Uh, and she's like leftovers. What do you mean? There's food from yesterday. I'm like, well, we <laughs> ate it yesterday. She's like, yeah, we're going to eat everything in that fridge. That's how oh, we roll. I love that. Your wife is just like, you're spoiled fucking ass. Oh, <laughs> hell yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. All right, Someone... Maura. So great catching up with you. Thank you again for me joining too. me. Always a great chat. And I will talk to you soon. I hope. Sounds good. Thank you. Maura Quint on Twitter at Behind Your Back. She is a very good follow on Twitter. Super smart, super funny. Really like her. And when I first started a podcast, I, I kind of wanted to have her be my co-host every day. I just couldn't afford to pay her. Uh, so I, I couldn't make that work. But that's how much I think of her because uh, she's just a, a really. There I am with the word really a truly authentic, funny, smart, passionate, very moral person. Maura Quint. Thank you, Maura. I hope to have her back again real soon. And now joining me is Christian Finnegan, who is here almost every Friday, as he was last Friday, but he was joined by his wife, Cambry, who was a big hit on the show. A lot of great feedback on Cambry Cruise. And Christian and I had a good conversation, as always. A great conversation. Got deep, got personal. We were talking about our drinking, and it was interesting, and I wonder, hopefully relatable, all of it hopefully is, but I just thought this was a good conversation to hear two guys talking the way that we were and the way that men can. And we, I think, exhibited that pretty well here. Vulnerable, honest, funny, thoughtful, thought provoking. Hopefully my now, my now, my conversation now with Christian Finnegan on Twitter at Christ Finnegan. Get all of his stand up comedy albums. Support him there, please. And listen to our conversation now here. OK, here he is now, the great Christian Finnegan joining me every Friday and psyched to have him here to kind of recap the week and just chat, just connect. And everybody loves when we do. And I always love to talk to you. Last week, we you and I were chatting and I mentioned we were talking about drinking and alcohol. And I mentioned how I've been really drinking this cheap whiskey, remember? And, yeah. and you mm -hmm. Evan Williams, Williams, right. Another plug for Evan Williams. And you told me, you know, if you got to drink it, drink it, you know, over Coke. So I did. I got some. Um, 
actual Coke, the, the one with sugar in it. Can't believe it. And mm -hmm. uh, it's been better for sure. But people heard <laughs> that conversation and I'm, it was the weirdest thing how much feedback I got from listeners that were just kind of outraged or sad for me that that you were not drinking fancier yeah. whiskey. So some listener looked up where I lived, found a liquor store in my town and left, like bought a gift certificate and said, go there now and then buy whatever bottle you want. <laughs> That, oh, that's, that's what nice. came of our conversation about uh, whiskey last week. But uh, well, gee, what what else do I? What else do you need? You can see if you can get a listener. Both my cars are on their last it? legs, so I'm really <laughs> concerned. But you know what? We um, for the first time, I know you've been traveling back and forth to New York and in, in your cabin upstate. Responsibly, yes, responsibly. Yeah, it didn't. <laughs> we got to talk about that. I mean, I, you know, it's like I, I get, I'm a little sensitive about it just because it's like we do, you know, we go from here to there and back, like we don't gallivant around and do things. So, but, uh, but you know, we, it's, you've done no yeah. gallivanting a little. I, I listen, I, you know, I, you, I can't go a full week without doing a little, yeah, gallivanting. I understand. And you know, me, the bon vivant. Uh, I what am. I was gonna say is I haven't filled up our gas tank on either car yet since we started sheltering mm -hmm. in place you know it's just we haven't gone anywhere yeah. yeah i went and i did have to fill up last week and it was like 197 a oh gallon. right i didn't even think of gas prices yeah, yeah. wow very cheap yeah. so uh mm -hmm. staying with drinking for a second how has your drinking uh changed drinking more drinking differently yeah, a lot um you know it's it's funny uh i had not I had taken January and February off Lately? like I was not drinking and I kind of was just going to wing it and see how long it went and or smoking and um, uh, smoking marijuana. But um, I had had a drink or two in early March just because it was like, all right, well, I'll treat myself if I'm at dinner and I want to get a glass of wine or something like that. But I had kind of laid down sort of rules for myself. Uh, you know, I'm not going to drink when I do comedy anymore, you know, like things like that. I, you know, I'm such a cheapskate in certain ways. Uh, it's hilarious to me that, that the Jews get the, the rap on being cheap when the Irish are so much cheaper. That right? Yeah. Um, oh, they're the, the worst. They're the worst tippers. They they don't spend money on anything. And I I don't think I'm uh, I'm not obviously from Ireland, but I think I do have a little of that sort of Irish thing in me where I I have a, this weird thing when I would do comedy shows that I would feel almost like to not drink was wasting money because the drinks right. are free. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? It's like when somebody gives you a drink ticket, it's like if I don't use this drink ticket, I'm throwing like yeah, it's a weird psychology. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Which is, you know, not a healthy way to live when you're in your uh, mid. So did you win? You know, you you kind of had those goals for not drinking and not smoking. And then did you just throw it out when the world changed? It all kind of went down. the. I pooper. wonder. Um, I mean, why did you make the choice to stop anyway? Was it? Well, 2020 and we I think we may have talked about this, uh, you know, a few weeks ago. 2020, hilariously enough, was my year to really try. <laughs> like it was my year to really re-engage my life and to set goals and to to stop beating myself up about things that happened in the past and not fret so much about what's happened in the future and just kind of do stuff. You know, I joined, I think I told you, I joined a choir, you know, and I, I've been taking Spanish. I had already gotten into this mode of like, Hey, I really want to make 2020 a year that I, that I, I kind of take a positive enriching your life towards life. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, reality was like, ha ha ha, you're hilarious. But, uh, <laughs> um, and so it wasn't, you know, and I don't think that I, you know, I think anytime you get to my age and you wonder, do I have issues with drinking? You probably do. <laughs> like if, if you're having to ask yourself that, that, I mean, it probably, it doesn't mean that you are necessarily an alcoholic, but it probably means that it's taking up a little more of your brain space than it should. You know, if you're wondering about sort of arranging your drinking habits, you know, well, I will allow myself to drink two drinks tonight and, and then I'm going to not drink until Thursday and then I will only drink after 6 p.m. You know, if you're having to spend that much time organizing your your drinking, then that, that you know, it, it, it implies that maybe you should take a hard well, look Well, I think, it. If, you know, you've always you've always. Uh, had you know different issues with with eating with drinking and maybe you haven't like i don't know if you like what is your you know what is the 
what are the parameters, you know, because maybe, maybe it's just very, it's personal to everybody. And I just kind of have a rule myself, which I follow, which is moderation. So how do you, where is the kind of central focus? Like how much do you think is too much? And when does it become, you know, when is it not moderation? I guess that was a long way of trying to get to that question. Wow. That was well, brutal. But I think it's a, <laughs> it's a little easier, I think, to be moderate when you have kids and responsibilities and things like that, because, you know, I have a big day tomorrow. I can't get drunk tonight because I have these things I'm excited about. I'm going to go do this thing or, or whatever. When you don't have that, you know, sometimes those, those uh, parameters are, are artificial and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. But I find that I really have to put those guardrails in place for myself or else I'll just kind of have hours disappear. It's not, not like blackout or anything like that. But what I mean is I just get listless and unproductive. You know, I don't, I don't get, I'm not like a huge angry drunk and you know, I don't, I don't have issues with that, but I just find that it's like, all right, well I'm drunk. So I guess I'm just staring at the wall I for see, the rest I, of the night I, and no pressure. I wonder what drunk me. means by the way. I feel like the words drunk and stoned aren't specific enough. True. Right. Like true. one person's drunk is, is not another person's maybe, but, but I think what I, what I'm hearing Christian is, and I think this is true of a lot of people. <laughs> I, by the way, I haven't seen my therapist in since this started. So this is doing great s- stuff for me. Uh, well, it, it's that it, it's about productivity. It's about that drinking yes. might replace something more productive, whether it be career and job related or learning Spanish and, and, and being in the choir. Like it's, there's this kind of I'd rather just chill out and drink or smoke than do something, quote, productive or healthy or or, or beneficial or something. Am I? Yeah, or it's kind of a it's a, a flattening, you know, um, there is a uh, a feeling without getting too, you know, weepy and hyper personal. There's a, a feeling I describe sometimes uh, to my my therapist that I, I call the the gray ache which is just this sort of overwhelming feeling of, of kind of bland hopelessness. Like it's not, it's not acute. It's not, woe is me. I'm going to drive off a bridge or anything like that. It's just a big sigh, you know? And, uh, and that is something that I, I fight against sometimes. And, uh, and sometimes I feel like the, the, quickest and easiest way to combat that if i don't have fun things to do is to just have a couple drinks and then turn on the tv or watch a movie or whatever which is a totally wonderfully fine thing to do like you said in moderation sporadically it's like i've had a hard day i just want to have a scotch or you know bourbon or whatever and and watch old episodes of mr show and that's just all i want to do and that is completely fine but when you then wake up and you're angry at yourself because oh i wanted to do this and i wanted to do that and that that's really also what it is it's just not wanting to just be mad at myself all. well i think what you're what you're to be what you're describing first of all i'm glad that you're doing it on the record i think it's super helpful for people to hear and as i'm talking with you here i'm like you know my conversations with christian can just be two friends talking about stuff and, and, and yeah, and, for, for people. Yeah. To hear. Beca- well, because what you're saying <laughs> is so relatable. I mean, you don't think that I'm sure you don't think that you're alone in this, but you'd probably often feel alone. I know I do when, I mean, like when I lost yeah. my job, I was like, I'm the only person who's ever lost their job. And, it, and, it, yes. and I knew cognitively that that wasn't true, but I felt like that. And, and so how has it changed? How have any of those feelings changed when this started? Because for me, it's like, well, how productive can you be? What, what can you get done yeah. when the world has ended? And I feel like we get, what are you doing any of it for? <laughs> well, that's <laughs> that even is, deeper. Uh, that's even deeper. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, and, and for myself and without uh, being too personal about my wife, you know, my, my wife reacts to things much more immediately than I do. Her, her, her emotions are much closer to the surface, positively and negatively. Mm-hmm. You know, when something upsets her, she gets very mm-hmm. upset. But then 20 minutes later, she's done with it. Whereas I don't get very upset. It just kind of goes into the into the pit. I put it in the drawer and it just kind of drags me down for the next 12 hours. <laughs> you know That's what I rough. mean? Yeah, yeah, and, I do. But sometimes I feel like my role in our relationship, and I, I may have said this before, is that I, I feel in a relationship that... uh 
somebody has to be the balloon and somebody has to be the ballast that, you know, somebody has to be the one sort of flying off the handle positively and negatively. And then someone has to be the one who kind of like keeps it on an even keel ish. And uh, so sometimes I think that like, am I, is, am I getting drunk right now as a way to mollify some of those feelings that I don't feel like I can express on a moment to moment basis, because I just don't want to create more drama. Like things are hard right now. You know, I, I was saying before we got on, it's, you know, you're, you're taking temperature checks. You're worried about, are you safe? And, you know, my wife is a cancer survivor. And, and, uh, and so you have to be extra diligent about these things. And th- we had a, a scare for, you know, that for a second, that we thought maybe she was sick. It turns out it wasn't, she was just having a hot flash or whatever. And it was fine. But, you know, I can't react. I have to be the one who kind of is like placid, you know, that's just my role in the relationship. And, but those, those emotions go somewhere. You know what I mean? Like they go somewhere and they tend to go into your stomach or wherever you keep your stress. And and they kind of just, they spread out and just kind of make every moment a little grayer than they would be. That's a really very uh, self-aware thing to to say. And I think just hearing that is, is important because you can't just, and it's especially for men, I think I'm going to genderize it, but the, the, the emotions do go somewhere and you just, you, you often don't know that. And then you at times can, you know, do make the wrong choices about it or self medicate or whatever. Do you think, cause I'm trying to think about my drinking. I'm definitely drinking a lot more and I'm enjoying it for the most part. Uh, but how much do you think about, is there a choice? Like I'm going to get this intoxicated or it, does it just happen? Um, it depends on the day, you know, and, and also I, I, I mean, it's, it's front of mind right now, just because it's like, just for my physical health, I've got to, trim back. I mean, just, you know, I'm, I'm gaining weight, you know, everybody, a lot of us, you think as a result of of uh, alcohol though, or yeah, Uh, but between out between alcohol and, you know, eating, you know, my, we've been baking cookies and stuff like that. So we've been eating a lot and you know, there's just not much to do right now. And when you're stuck in the house all day, every day kind of becomes just a, a, uh, a relay race between the last time you ate and the next time, you, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> whether yeah. it's like, all right, it, it, have, has it been two hours since lunch where I can have my afternoon snack that, you know, ties me over until dinner, you know, and, and you're, so you're just constantly eating, you're sitting down a lot. I mean, even if you're extra, like I went for a run earlier today, but that's, going to be the only real exercise I get. And, you know, I'm in, I've been living in New York since I was 18 years old, just by virtue of being in New York, you constantly are right, walking up right, and down right. stairs. You, you just get that daily exercise. And so the, the substance stuff, it's not even just the, uh, you know, being drunk all the time. It's just, it's calories, you know? So there's sort of, I, I sort of feel like we're all reaching that point. Not, not everybody necessarily, but uh, talking amongst my friends where, that little roller coaster ride is going to have to end pretty soon. I think we've all been kind of like the, you know, the all bets are off right now. I'm drinking what I want. I'm yep. eating what I want. Kind of almost like when you're on a plane and you just feel like it doesn't count. Yep. So you can, ha- you can get the giant bag of peanut M&Ms and be like, fuck it. I'm Why on a plane. does the plane give us um, that excuse? So many people can relate to what you just said. What is it about the plane that makes it feel like, Oh, I can do whatever I want. I'm on a plane. I hear that a lot. Because, because, well, we don't, we don't feel like we have a choice because the healthy options you can get in the airport are garbage and they're free. Right. <laughs> that's the, an- you know that's I mean? the answer. You'd- so if I'm going to overpay for something, I'm going to overpay for something that's, that's delicious, it. not some awful chicken Caesar wrap that is like, <laughs> you know, got 0.2 ounces of chicken. What in it. by the way is the most high caloric alcohol? Because I, I always just think beer is, is the only thing. Well, yeah, I mean, I drink beer too, (laughs) but, um, uh, I mean, generally speaking, brown, the darker, the liquor, the more sugar and more more sugar, right, right, right. Bourbon. Yeah. Bourbon is, uh, thought of as having more calories than like vodka, Mm. which is theoretically the, the, the slim. What about wine? Uh, I think I have a friend that I don't know. You know, I think. I think red is actually might be a little better than white. I, I, you know what? I'm talking up my That's ass fun. here though. Cause I don't really know much. Uh, when you say that you're talking to your, when you're talking to your friends, how have you been maintaining relationships with other people? 
Well, um, you know, I, we did go on a, a hike with a couple of friends of ours. Um, you know, at one point where, you know, we walked eight feet apart from each other, but you know, um, so I, and, and I, in there, so I've had some Skype calls with people and, we there uh, a bunch of my friends have done a, a zoom like a, a big zoom meeting a couple of times which is fun ish i mean it's fun to see people at one point we had i think like 15 people yeah. on zoom which is great but it's like i have a, a usb mic so my audio is pretty good but if you're just talking through your laptop you know how it is when people are just talking through their laptop you don't hear the beginning of what they say and so you're constantly like what yep. what and nothing nothing makes a joke land better than when you have to repeat it three times it's hard with, it's definitely that's, hard with humor with these things. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things to do. Actually, if, uh, I may have said this before, but, um, if somebody busts on you, if somebody yeah, says yeah, yeah. like, uh, like slams you and they think it's really funny, just, just ask them to repeat it. Just, I'm sorry. What, what you told, because it'll just, you told me that it. with my yeah. daughter here, um, a couple of weeks ago and it was, oh, it was right. such yeah. a perfect lesson for her. Yeah. That's a, a great defense <laughs> mechanism. I thought it would be funny. I was talking to my neighbor the other day who has a pretty similar um, view on social distancing. We're both pretty much following. Let's just say we're pretty much following the rules pretty, pretty well. And it's the only neighbor who I'm uh, good friends with. And we're sitting there talking. We're about 10 feet away. And I just said to him, I go, what would you do if right now I just ran at you? It was just like the weirdest <laughs> thought, right? Like you would never yeah. think that distance would matter in a conversation yeah. with someone. I was like, what if I just ran at you? What would you do? And I think, what would you do? I think we would all kind of do the same thing. It, I mean, I, I think it might depend on who the person was, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's uh, if it was somebody who, you know, if it was like your mom or something, then uh, you might end up just, kind of giving in and hugging that person or whatever, if, or if you were a single dude and it was some sexy lady who came running at you like a, in a David Lee Roth video. But uh, if, if it was just my neighbor, Pete, uh, I don't know that I, I imagine I would just kind of be like, ah, you know, give you one of the hands but, in the yeah, air. But ah. I think it would be worse. I think it would be, I would turn and run away. I'm like, oh, and I would like run away from him. If he started running, I would back away. I think that's what I would do. Yeah. As if this one person is now coronavirus turned. Uh, yeah. Like, I think just, that's how we're yeah. acting. Well, you sent this article uh, that we can talk about, but just the, the idea yeah. of uh, whether or not shaming works. And we're all I'm finding that we're evolving with how we're seeing these rules as, as time moves on. Like my wife is pretty much like really relaxing stuff um, and thinking about, you know, n not as worried about getting together with people and we haven't done anything, but our daughters are, are hanging out with the kids down the street, just them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did, my one daughter did have a, a social distance date, went to a girl's birthday party. And by the way, when I dropped her off in the driveway, another girl had just shown up and she ran and hugged that girl. Not my wife. My, my, these, I saw yeah. these two girls hug and I get, my daughter gets out and I'm, I just became the biggest asshole in the world. I said to her, I was like, I was like, Hey, let's call her Rebecca. I go, Rebecca, don't hug my daughter. Sorry. No yeah. hugging. I know we're not hugging. Yeah. And I felt like what a fucking weird thing to have to say out loud, but also them's mm -hmm. the rules. Um, how are we changing? And does shaming work? No, shaming doesn't work. I mean, I think we all have both of, we all, we've all been on both sides of this coin. You know, we've all been the person who, you know, you see those pictures of all the people hanging out in, you know, the park a couple weeks ago and we're like, these assholes, you know, they're going to get us all sick. And, and then we've also been the person who wasn't wearing a mask because we were walking 10 feet from our car to our front door and you see somebody react. So like, Oh, you know, and we see it online too. And the thing is, Twitter, you know, social media and Twitter specifically, because that's the one I spend the most yep. time on, it rewards feeling like a scold anyway. Like even pre-COVID, there's nothing that people look for more than a, a moment to be sort of high and mighty and to pass judgment on people for saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. And this is not a left or a right thing. I would say, if anything, people on the left are a bit worse about it. 
you know, of seeing an opportunity to kind of like, oh, you use the wrong pronoun or, you know, things like that, or just, you know, and some, you know, and a lot of it's stuff that I believe, but the tactic of just sort of, ah, got you, shame, shame right. on you. I get to be the good guy here. You know, it's absurd. And that's been something that's been a problem, you know, for a long time, but the coronavirus has, is, this is, this is springtime for scolds. I mean, this is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you are a pedant, I mean, this is, this is your dream come true. Um, and so it, I can understand people, you know, you see some of these people online who are like, I would never, and a lot of it is class-based too. It's like, oh, why don't people just hang out in their backyards and stuff like, oh yeah, not everyone has those options. Not everybody can just go for a 10 mile drive in their Range Rover because they're feeling cooped up. You know, if you're, if you're living in a, uh, you know, a housing project, or if you're living in a small apartment in Flushing, you know, and you're Chinese immigrants and you're, you're really, uh, you know, 20 other families living in your building, it's, it's very easy for someone living in, you know, the lap of luxury in the suburbs or in, you know, Connecticut, or when they went back to their parents' house and the Jersey shore to pass judgment on people. And, and that, that's another reason that, you know, these, these lockdown protests, I mean, why there's such horseshit because none of it's about lockdown. It's because don't tell me what to do. It's don't tell me what to do, but also it's just a parade. Like we were saying last week, it's a chance to show off your stupid long gun. Like, like it's a, like it's your new pair yeah. of shoes that you want to show off. Um, but you know what happens when people don't want to do social dis- distancing they don't go out to a damn protest at the city hall. They just stop doing it. You, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, we've like, seen that this I, week I, in, I, in different restaurants and, and bars. And I knew that was going to be the case, especially as the weather started to get better. People are just going to stop doing it. And so I think it's really important for the powers that be, you know, state, federal, local, to give release valves. You know, you have to open up the parks. You have to open up some circumstances you have to let people have options to just break up their day so they're not just staring at the same four walls and so they feel some degree of social uh a social fabric around them that that they that there's a life that exists outside the four walls of their apartment you know because because otherwise people are just going to chuck it all but i but I, you know which is dangerously close to yeah i don't i don't disagree with any of that but the the the, the fear the concern is that when you know if, if that it comes back and it, and it well may it may well come and back, worse but uh, but all you can do is try to play you try to thread the needle to mitigate this as best you can and eternal no one's first of all nobody's arguing for eternal lockdowns even you know that's, right. that's sort of a right-wing talking point nobody wants that it's just is somebody really of, saying that somebody's arguing, arguing for eternal lockdown well that, that's a straw man that's the straw man that people on the right use it's like oh well you want to be you know you the liberals you know fauci wants us locked down forever i promise you right. that's not true um but i had a point and now it's gone do you think Sometimes do you think, but I feel like it's, it's become partisan again. Like this has become partisan and it's become, Oh, of but, course but I is. think it's partisan based on this, what we've seen in the past, long before the pandemic, the anti-science, right? Like the Republicans are anti-science. I'm generalizing here, but overwhelmingly they are, there's so many of them are on so many issues. And so when you, you see all the epidemiologists in full agreement and, and granted there's a lot we don't know about this and, and we won't know for a while, but you have to do your best to trust the people that know what they're doing on any of these issues. And it's like you saw that the, the Democrats in the Senate wearing masks this week, the Republicans not wearing masks. You see the red states, they're more likely to get together at the bar and at the restaurant and then than the blue states or the liberal leaning people. And like, what is this? How are this is this is nuts that we're divided based on the best science or that we just don't trust. They don't trust Fauci or the best scientists, epidemiologists. Well, clearly. There is a, a massive distrust of, of expertise in general. Um, I mean, and that is some of that sort of baked into the American. Yes. Yeah, uh, Tom Nichols has a book about uh, that. Chris Hayes has a book about that. There's a, there's yeah. a lot that's been. Don't tell me what to do, Mr. Fancy Pants. You know, the, some of that is just kind of American. But a lot of it, too. But I, I think, want my doctor to tell me what to do. Like, I, I, like I, I understand that mentality, do. but but I do want 
the scientist to tell me what to do. And then, you know, I'll probably gather information and decide what's best. But I do want them to use their education, their experience to give me their best take. What does that make me? Of course. Yeah. You would never you would never buy a I car a co- that your friend just built from right. scratch. You know, you would want some sort of uh, licensed professional to let you know that it was safe. But to believing drive. the media, meteor- get believing the, the meteorologist, does that make me a cuck? Uh, apparently i also think that a lot of people on the right they just can't abide not being on the offense that just they've gotten into this mode and this sort of started around the tea party i mean you could say it even started at newt gingrich but certainly uh the tea party of just attack 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 and never let up like always put democrats and left on their heels by constantly moving forward and it's been it's been a very successful project you know it it ends up moving the goalposts constantly further in their directions and uh you know when the pandemic hit there was a momentary feeling of okay time for the experts to speak up here's what we've got to do And I think for a few weeks, a lot of people on the right were trying to figure out how do we attack in this scenario? Because politically, they've kind of learned that they can just say, la, 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 put their fingers in their ear. And there really isn't much defense against it. I mean, I have a bit on one of my albums about how it's it's impossible to win an argument with a stupid person because, you know, I'm not going to go into the bit, but it's just, you know, uh, there's no response there's no response that to, you know, if, if you're arguing with somebody and they're like, uh, 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 you know, there's no, there's no defense against yeah. that. Um, and politically they've been kind of proven right in the sense that, Oh, just double down yeah. constantly, just double down. And if you say we're wrong, just double down and go harder because we'll last longer than they will and they'll fold and we won't. And that's sort of become the governing philosophy. And I think that what, they have and probably will discover is that those rules don't necessarily apply when you're talking about a virus. But we'll see. I mean, it's, uh, it's so much remains to be seen so much uncertainty and you know, it, it's, uh, it's just, I guess I just, nobody knows nothing. I said it before. I, I probably said yeah. it to you. It's, I, I just remind myself that, and I'm not saying that to set, to make myself feel better. It doesn't make me feel good or bad. It's just the truth. I just, you know, I read the articles that I, you know, by people who I respect and I take it for what it is, but in the end of the, at the end of the day, we really don't know what things are going to look like three months from now. And to pretend you do is hubris arrogance. All right. I'll wrap it there because, uh, uh, it's, uh, we're talking 30 minutes. I don't want to take out too much of your time, but, um, what whiskey should I buy? Um, I or am bourbon. a fan of uh, Woodford, uh, Bourbon, um, I'm a big fan of Woodford uh, Preserve, okay. or Woodford Reserve, mm-hmm. rather. Um, I think it's made by Maker's Mark, but it's like their fancy brand. Um, it's kind of in that that mode of where it's, it's good, but it's not ridiculous. Like, I'm the kind of person, I can tell the difference between a $50 bottle of bourbon and a $20 bottle of bourbon, but I can't tell the difference between a $500 bottle of bourbon and a $50 bottle. You know, like, my taste goes only so high. Same thing with like watches. When somebody shows me a watch and they tell me it was $500, that seems very fancy to me. And you could show me a $10,000 watch right next to it. And I would not be able to tell you the difference. That's a great analogy. And I share that. Although I couldn't tell the difference between any of them. All right. uh, I am going to go off to the liquor store now with that recommendation. As always, Woodford. thank you very much for your time, buddy. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, dude. Talk to you soon. Christian Finnegan on Twitter at Christ Finnegan. That was good. I, I enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed that. And thank you for listening all the way to the end, like so many of you do. And send me your feedback and who you want to hear on the show. And give the show a rating and five stars and all that jazz. Support me on Patreon.com with a paid subscription. There is a link in the show notes. And what else can I tell you? Uh, yeah, could somebody buy us a, a new car? Crazy. Pathetic asking for things not at all i appreciate your support your listening your subscriptions thank you very much that is a hell of a week this week i've had with shows and uh, life i hope that you are hanging in there i hope that you are staying connected and in your own reality i hope there are people in your life 
that you're connected with that you don't feel alone if you do reach out and uh, connect with me with somebody do yourself a favor and stay healthy your mental health your physical health it matters so much so try to reset every day try to meditate try to get out exercise eat right and everything that needs to be done and i look forward to hearing from you all right i'm gonna stop talking now thank you for listening stay close you're not alone i love you goodbye